Good evening. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Morris Hills. I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to lift our praises and our voices to our King. Lord of all creation, of water, earth, and sky. The heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high. The God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. You are holy.
And one of the greatest gifts we have is when the Lord impresses on our heart that we actually need him. Amen.
same God that never fails will not fail me now. He won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high.
sound Once lost and now found Heaven came down And grace rescued me Oh, how sweet the sound Once lost and now found Oh, heaven came down Grace rescued me For oh, how sweet the sound Once lost and now found For oh, heaven it came down And grace rescued me Hallelujah, I am free From my sin and penalty at the cross you took my place With your grace on top of grace Hallelujah, I am free From my sin and penalty At the cross you took my place With your grace on top of grace With your grace on top of grace your grace on top of grace With your grace on top of grace I mean, I don't know about you, but that just lifts me on a Wednesday night. You know, the end of a long day, and we just sing his praises. Let's bow our heads to our King. Lord God, thank you, Father. For gathering us, Lord, thank you for your grace. Father, thank you for your love and your sacrifice. And Lord, thank you for your word that you left behind for us, Father, so that we could know you, so that we could pursue you, so that we could gain knowledge and gain wisdom. But Lord, really just to gain your truth that we could just bury into our hearts, Lord, and carry it with us. Father, we love you. I ask you to open our ears and our minds, our eyes tonight to hear what's been prepared for us, Lord. We thank you for it. And Lord, we pray this all in the mighty name of our King and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Folks, you can go ahead and have a seat. Well, good evening. Oh, are we sleepy? <laughs> Barry just said he's all excited and awake and everyone else is asleep. Barry, I think it worked for, them, for you, not them. Well, welcome to Calvary Chapel, Morris Hills. My name is Pastor John. Thanks for being with us tonight. Still silent. It's just awesome. This is going to be fun. Well, I'll tell you now, by the time the, the message is over, maybe the, the silence is uh, warranted. If you're new with us, haven't been here in a while, thank you for being with us tonight. Thanks for taking the time out of the middle of your week after, like Barry said, a long day to be with us. If you haven't ever before, you'll find a, a connection card in the seat pocket in front of you. And if you wouldn't mind filling out as much information as you're comfortable with on the front and on the back, you can hand it in uh, by putting it in the offering box at the back of the room on your way out. Or if you've never filled one out, come find me after the service. I'd love to shake your hand and say hello myself. After the service, as always, our cafe is open. Stop on in, meet someone, say hi to someone, and then get out of here. Now I'm joking. <laughs> Uh, Sunday services again, 9.15 or 11. Join us as we're continuing in the Word. And so we'll, have, we'll see you there. Uh, I don't know if there's actually any more baby dedications this week. I think we had six in a row. It's either five or six. I don't know if we have any more this week, but join us anyway. Tonight we'll be continuing where we left off Sunday in Hebrews. So tonight, Hebrews chapter 12. We'll be picking it up at verse 12. It's page 1070 in the Bible, here in the seat. So you can turn on your devices, open up your Bibles, use the Bibles here, Hebrews 12, and let's pray and we'll get into the Word. Lord, we are so thankful for our night, so thankful that we can be here learning of you, studying of you. Lord, this is one of those passages where the Word encourages, the Word challenges, the Word convicts, the Word comforts. And Lord, so many times in this life, we need you to encourage, we need you to comfort we need you to convict. Lord, complacency seems to be the, 
the motto or the theme of our culture. And you are not a complacent God. And so we're so thankful, Jesus, that you don't leave us alone, that you continue to prod us, you poke us, Lord, you, you spur us on, Lord, in love and good works. So we put this night, we put this passage before you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, if you've ever noticed in life, life is never, a, a, we don't live a flat line life. We have the valleys, we have the hills, we have the good times, the bad times, we have the challenging times. We have almost, I'll even say, the apathetic times where we're just kind of existing. And even in our lives of faith, even in our walks with the Lord, there are moments a victory, there's moments where we feel defeated, there's the highs and the lows. And this passage that we're going to be looking at tonight really does encapsulate a lot of those high moments and those low moments. So we have come as far as verse 12 in chapter 12, which begins with a therefore. And if you ever see the word therefore, you always have to ask the question, what is it therefore? So because of this, therefore, the idea connects with everything else that has been said before it. This long section, remember, as it was written, there were no chapter breaks in regards to faith being the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And then how great this great company in the Old Testament, whether it be Abel or Enoch or Noah, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Rahab, whether it was Samson or David, those who failed and succeeded, but how did they walk their lives? Those two words, by faith. And they walked out their lives by faith in all of those places of their lives. And then we're told to therefore, because you and I are surrounded by that testimony, you don't have any excuses. There's nothing you can bring to the table that that lineage of faith doesn't answer. Well, Lord, I don't know if I, if I can walk with you. I've messed up. Well, did you mess up as much as Samson? Have you messed up more than David? Did you mess up more than some of these other characters? Remember, Rahab the harlot takes away our excuses. The grandmother of David, the ninth great-grandmother of Jesus Christ himself, the Messiah. All of our excuses are removed by this lineage of faith. Seeing that we are surrounded by that great cloud of witnesses, let us run the race that is set before us with both patience and endurance. We are not called to a sprint. I am so thankful I'm not called to a sprint. Yesterday, my daughter, she, uh, she's a sprinter. She does the 4 by 100 relay, and she's fast. And it's like, I'm glad that's not what life was like, because I would die around the first bend of life. But we're not called to a sprint. This is a long journey that we need endurance, we need patience with. There is an endurance that is needed, and that endurance is provided by God's grace. And we are to ever be looking off always onto Jesus. Remember, we, we have to fix our eyes on him, it says. Ever looking off always onto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. For the joy that was set before him, what was the joy that was set before him? Us. We are the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, because I enjoy history, my kids make fun of me for enjoying history so much. I love history. And so really understanding what does the right hand mean? Well, go back to medieval times. And the right hand of the king was a place of rest and victory. You would find someone sitting there who the, the king had sent on a quest or on something, a task of something. And when that task was completed and fulfilled, the king allowed that person to sit at the right hand to show that they have completed what has been asked of them. And I think of that with Christ, that he has completed the work of redemption. He is at a place of rest. He is at a place of victory, sitting at the right hand of the throne room of God. We must be considering him, the one if we are ever looking off onto him, that he endured such difficult things at the hand of sinners for sinners. He was scourged by sinners and he was scourged for sinners. You and I are not enduring what he endured. I'm thankful for that. We haven't resisted sin to the point of shedding blood. We haven't. 
So we're really told, we're encouraged here. Let's get a grip. Let's get some perspective in life. Yes, life can be difficult at times, but you have not resisted sin to the point of death, to the point of blood. He has. We're encouraged to run this race set before us individualistically. We're to stay in our lane. We have a customized course that has been made just for us. You're not running against other Christians. You're running in your own lane. You're running against yourself, as it were. And understand, your Father in heaven, he is committed to this because as we go through difficulties, we have those highs and lows. He's there to chasten us, to educate us, to encourage us, to strengthen us, to instruct us and to discipline us when needed. It's all part of the process of this journey of this race. We are reminded on Sunday that earthly fathers, they chase and they discipline for their own pleasure. They have to take care of their kids and they have to deal with them. But it says that your heavenly father, he does it strictly for your profit. He disciplines, he chastens, he corrects purely for you, nothing to do with him. He strengthens us, he challenges us. He does it all for our profit. And it says that he does that so that we might be partakers, co-heirs of his holiness. And obviously, we know that chastening is not pleasurable in the moment. No one enjoys getting disciplined. Nobody wakes up in the morning and goes, I hope I get it today. And then remember what the author says, but afterward, nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And those who are exercised, those who are worked out, those who are, in a sense, put into the gym, and God works with them and he works things out of them. So this is a journey. It's an exercise. If he's taking you to the gym to work you out, that's evidence of his love for you. And that's evidence that you are a son or a daughter of him and that you have a heavenly father. We are to be worked out and exercised in this pilgrimage. There are ups and downs. There are highs and lows. But we need to think of all of those people that we read about in chapter 11. They ran this race. They ran their course. Yes, even Rahab. The people ran the course. And you and I have more than they do because they were looking ahead to the Messiah and we can be ever looking off always onto Jesus Christ himself knowing he's the Messiah who we see more clearly than they ever did. So we're run, to run with endurance or to run with patience. And sometimes we watch the news and it seems like the more and more you watch the news, the closer and closer that finish line seems to be. It's like you kind of get up in the morning, it's like, what happened today in the world? What happened last night? What's going to happen today? And as we read here, we need to be ever looking off onto him once again and consider what he endured, not the, the temporary, the fleeting affliction of this life. We haven't gone to the place that he went to. He went to the cross. No one here has been hung on a cross. You know, I doubt, we talked about this on Sunday, I doubt many of us, if any of us, will ever see or experience martyrdom. Yeah, we'll be chastened. Yes, we will be disciplined. But this chastening is in the race that the Lord has given us, and the chastening is in and by the hand of the Father. And it's strictly to profit us that we might be partakers of his holiness and yield that peaceable fruit of righteousness. So for tonight, the message that the titles of the, the titles, the message's title is the ups and downs of sanctification. The ups and downs of sanctification. Now, as I studied this, I was like, wait a minute, when we get saved, it's not just easy. I thought it was easy, right? You get saved, you accept Jesus, you're going to heaven, easy street, right? Mm -mm. Difficulties, victories, joys, defeats, sorrows. So I'm going to read the whole passage first, verses 12 to 17, and then we're going to chew it through and take off some bites and work our way through it. So starting in verse 12. Therefore, strengthen the hands 
which hang down in the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. So therefore, because of all of this stuff, we come to verse 12. In light of everything from chapter 1 of verse 11 up until chapter 11 of verse 12, because of all of that, In this race, we're seeing that we're accompanied. We have this great cloud of witnesses. We have examples. Seeing that the Father is there and that he's only profiting profiting us in this journey. There are pros. There are good things in this journey, in this life. There are encouragements. And then there are the cons, the warnings, the ups and the downs. You know, first of all, we're going to go through the pros. And it's like, look, you're getting close to the finish line. Lift up your hands that are hanging down. Straighten out those knees that are starting to wear out. How many of you feel like your knees are wearing out? (laughs) Make smooth or make straight the path for those who are running so that literally their joints are not twisted, but out of joint. And again, I love that it says that there should be healing involved. We're to follow, we're to pursue peace with all men and holiness. And then there's the cons, there's the downs, the warnings, and there's three lests. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up and causing trouble. And thirdly, lest there be any fornicator or profane person among you. So we have the ups and the downs of our sanctification. So again, repetition reinforces. Verse 12, therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Okay, so think of it like a coach. Again, I'm going to use a lot of analogies because with with my daughter running track, there's a lot of easy analogies here, low-hanging fruit. It's like a coach. You're getting close to the finish line. You're in a race, and you have the coach on the sideline saying, I know you're tired, but push. Pick up your hands. Your knees are getting locked up. Look, straighten things out. The idea is to reinvigorate, to give you strength, to bring renewal, to bring more and direct purpose to what is going on. And he's saying here, let's do that with one another. You're getting close to the finish line. And let's make the rest of the course not necessarily straight, but also smooth is the more literal way of putting it. So that as you run, nothing's twisted, nothing's wrenched out of joint. Everything is smooth from the end on. And literally in this race, says at the verse, at the end of verse 13, but rather be healed, that there is healing involved in this. I don't know how long your race is going to be in this life. You know, you talk to a lot of marathoners and the last five miles are the most difficult So when that wall comes in and they're exhausted and they're done and all they can do is look down and put one foot in front of the other. Their bodies are shot. But it's also in those last five miles when all of a sudden they get reinvigorated. They can get through that wall, get that second wind, and they start picking up their pace. And they can start running faster. Again, it's like a coach is out there saying it's the fourth quarter. You got to leave it all on the field. Leave it all on the court. Leave your heart out there. We all have to run this race with endurance, knowing that there is a higher purpose, a higher goal. You're not living out this life just so that you look good by the world's standards. You're living out this life so that when you go to the other side, you can hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into your reward. That's our race. That's what we're running towards. 
And there's an encouragement here as we're all, you know, putting this all before us. You know, you think about it, you're running a race. My, this morning, Lila, what did she do yesterday? She did the hurdles, she did the high jump, she did the relay. I can't think if she did anything else. But this morning she woke up and she's like, my legs are shot. And so being the good loving dad, I, get, I gave her a little Charlie horse. No, I didn't. That would be horrible. But your legs are locked up. Your knees are out of joint. You're just exhausted. And the encouragement is, it's time to run harder. It's time to run faster. And there's a we involved that we're trying to make the rest of this smooth sailing as best as we can. We don't want anybody out of joint here. We don't want there to be something of of difficulty or of injury, but we want it to be a place and a, a time of healing. You can run this difficult race because of the one who's accompanying you, who's chasing you, and doing that for your profit that you might be partakers of his holiness. Again, we have a running partner. We have a running mate. Christ, I can't think of anyone better to live this life alongside me with than Christ. So there's not just pain, but there's healing. There's not just weariness, but there's renewal. And we have that inheritance that is undefiled, incorruptible, that fades not away, that is reserved for us in heaven, that is set before us. And so we have to run, we have to encourage, and there is, again, a plural where we should be encouraging one another. We should encourage other people. We should help make their path smooth or straight if we can. We should be helping remove any hindrance, any barricade. You know, go pave all the potholes in their life if we can. Help them get to the end. We should help, if we can, set things in front of them that make it easier. You should not be an obstacle in their life of faith. You shouldn't be. They shouldn't have to worry about trying to get around or get through or deal with you in life when life already has enough stuff. And as men and women believing in Jesus Christ, as brothers and sisters in the faith, we are there to help lift up those arms, to encourage, listen, lift up your chin. Look up. You're not defeated. You're getting to the end. It's exhausting, but it's okay. We're here doing it together. It's all part of this pilgrimage that we are on. It's all part of the race that we are on. Again, it is not a sprint. Your race might be 40, 50, 60 years. Your race might be less. But the thought, the reality behind this is strengthening the hands which hang down. How do we come alongside one another and strengthen each each other's hands? I think back to Exodus 17, the battle of the Amalekites. Joshua's in the valley fighting. Moses is up on the the, the rim of the valley looking down. And as long as Moses' arms were lifted up, there was victory in the valley. But after a while, his arms started to droop and started started to get tired. And Joshua and the Israelites were starting to experience defeat. And so men came around Moses and they started holding up his arms and lifting up his arms. And even after a while, they started getting tired. So they set stones under his arms for him to rest his arms in and keep them uplifted. Those men could have easily become, you know, use Moses' arms as monkey bars and start pulling his arms down because they're starting to get tired. But instead, they removed themselves from the equation and they put something in to help hold his arms up. And there was a great victory that day. And actually in that story, when you think of the Old Testament names of God, you see there Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is our banner, or the Lord is our victory. Had nothing to do with Joshua, had nothing to do with Moses, had everything to do with the Lord using human objects or tools for his glory. And that's the race that we are in. We are being used in this life, in each other's life, for his glory. You know, we are conditioned in, in, in today's culture accolades how many thumbs up do you get how many hearts do your do your posts get how many how many acknowledgments do you get from people we're conditioned to look for that and to pursue that you know i think of the entire world of influencers on social media their entire job is to make sure that they look so appealing that you are enticed to click on what they have to say and then it's like what you said in the picture that you showed me have nothing to do with each other but they had such enticement there with that, with that picture or with that, that small video that you wanted more. We're enticed for accolade. 
oh, my last post only got 300 likes, but the one before that got 500, so people don't like me now. This is telling us we should be looking for the people that need encouragement, and just because of the race they're on and the race we're on, we're to encourage them, we're to lift them up without any reward attached to it. Nothing. To help them get through their life smoother with nothing attached. With nothing attached. It's being others-centered. We don't know how to be others-centered. We know how we want others to center around me, but we don't know how to, how to focus ourselves around other people. And this year, the encouragement here is we should be helping make people's path straight or smoother. And I like that imagery even more of smoother, not just straight, but smooth. You know, think of a road that is filled with potholes. And it's a rough ride. And then you get to a, you know, a new fresh pavement. You're like, oh, this is awesome. It's what we're supposed to be doing with each other's life. Making those ways smooth. Making those ways straight. And we're also told something else we're to do in verse 14. Pursue peace. Pursue peace with all people and holiness. Without which no one will seek or see the Lord. So this word pursue, if you're using a different translation, I might say follow. It's actually a present imperative. What does that mean? It's a command. It's not a suggestion. It's not, hey, you should be doing this. It's no, you are doing this. You are pursuing peace. And it's in the present tense, which means you are to be continually pursuing peace. There's a continuance to it that doesn't stop. It can be pursuing an enemy in war, or it could be talking about pursuing a particular thing in life, but it means something that you seek diligently, with strong effort and without a lack of intensity. That's how we are to pursue peace with each other. And this is something that you have to do. It is not a suggestion. You must be continually, with fervency, pursuing peace. Now, I can end the message right there because I can think of people that I need to pursue peace with and I think you can think of people you need to pursue peace with. There might be people in this room that you need to pursue peace with. Do it. Don't leave tonight without pursuing peace. There are, no, there are those that I need to be more at peace with. We are selfish in our own fallen nature and it's always if there's an offense, you come to me. You come make peace with me. But pursuing peace means you are running after them. The nature of Christ is doing something different, doing something else within us. And we have to deny our inclination or deny our desires of being pursued and become the one that is pursuing. It doesn't come naturally to us at all, at all. We're offended, let's be honest. We like grudges sometimes. We do. We like grudges. We like holding on to things. We like making sure that people know they've wronged us. Do you understand at that moment they are keeping you in bondage and you're allowing it? That you're a slave to them at that point? They have power over your life at that point? We're going to get to that in a minute when we talk about bitterness, all kinds of fun stuff. But we must be pursuing and seeking peace constantly. One of the greatest statements from Chuck Smith, who's the, the founder of Calvary Chapel, who, who started this movement, he said, Grace received becomes grace bestowed. How many of you have received grace from Jesus Christ? Only three of you. Awesome. <laughs> well, the three of you then should be bestowing that grace on others around you. Because grace received becomes grace bestowed. And when you realize what the Lord has done for you, it eliminates any license that you have not to be gracious. If you're sitting in church thinking, yeah, I need God's grace, amen. But that guy over there, yeah, he really needs God's grace. Then you don't understand anything about grace at all. Nothing. Nothing. You should be sitting here and looking around this room and thinking, I hope I don't get struck by lightning because everybody else belongs here but me. And grace received becomes grace bestowed. You know, Paul, I'll paraphrase the Apostle Paul. He says, if I'm getting in, everybody can get in. If you're getting in, anybody can get in. So grace that you have received is grace that you need to give. 
And we are to seek diligently. Again, it's not a suggestion. It's a command. And it's continually because that's the way this journey is. And we are to continually be pursuing peace with all men. Paul will say, be at peace with men as much it is as it is with you. And I like him saying that more. It's over in Philippians 2.14. As far as it is with you, be at peace with all men. I like that one better because I can say, God, I've tried everything and he doesn't respond yet. So can I go thump him in the head? <laughs> that one gives me more license. This verse takes all that license away. It has nothing to do with a person's response. You are to constantly be pursuing peace. And as we are seeking, as we are pursuing peace, we are also told to be pursuing holiness. And most of the Greek translators context that word, or, uh, the, they translate that word in this context as sanctification. Not just holiness, but sanctification. In other words, we're born again. We're something different. Our nature changes. Part of our very nature should be that we seek peace with other men. The way that we used to live is not the way we should live. It isn't though as though we're going to get more holy on our own effort though. The very righteousness of Christ is bestowed upon us in faith when we trust him. There's regeneration. What does regeneration mean? We are created into something new. We are born again. We are given a new life, a new destiny, a new purpose, a new direction. And the reason God chastens us is for our own profit, that we might be partakers in his holiness. So the way that he chastens us and what he's doing when he's chastening us is that he is molding, shaping, and forming us more into his likeness. Think of a lump of clay. And any master potter that beats on that clay until a masterpiece comes out of it. It doesn't start that way. It starts as a lump of dirt in water. And as they impress their, their hands and as they, they form it and as they shape it and mold it, a work of art comes out of it. That's sanctification. And that we might be partakers of that sanctification, of that process of being made to look like Christ. And yes, though chase, chastening is not pleasant, it yields that peaceable, peaceable with all men fruit of righteousness. So again, let's go back to the coach. He's saying, come on, guys, this is supposed to strengthen you. Shake it off. Get up. Let's go. Loosen your arms. Let's run. You got five miles left. You can see the finish line. I know it's hard, but we're making this as smooth as we can for you. We want this. We want to make this. We want you to be. This needs to be a time of healing. God does not want this race of life that he has called you to to be destructive. And that's not why he takes us on this journey of faith. And what we need to constantly be doing in this journey of faith is pursuing peace with other men and other women in this life. You're not racing someone else. You're not competing against the person sitting next to you. You have your own course. You have your own lane. You have your own sanctification, your own salvation. And as you go on, life should become cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. Another theological great, Charles Fuller. He once said that the longer he walks with the Lord, the less he sins, but the more he repents. The less he sins, but the more he repents. That's pursuing sanctification. When you first get saved, you think, all right, Lord, I'm going to stop doing the drugs. I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to stop going around and punching people. I'm going, to start, I'm going to stop living immorally. You're asking a lot, God, but hey, fine, all right. And as you go on, as we become more and more in the light, and as we become walking more and more with him, we become more and more aware of the traitor that lives within, the traitor that's in the mirror every morning. And the things in our life, that are not yet Christ-like. We become more aware of those things. And we come to a place where we sin less, but we repent more. All right, God, I'm doing, trying to live more for you, but there's a lot more stuff that I got to repent of. We seek peace with other men as best as we can, constantly pursuing peace. 
We should be pursuing it, and we are told to pursue it because it doesn't come naturally. Can any of us obtain peace with someone else naturally? Be like, oh, we're good. No problem. Those are things that we need to be working on. And this is evidence of your new life in Christ. Without those things, he tells us here that nobody will see the Lord. And now the author is going to switch to the things that we need to look out for. The ups and the downs, now we're going to the downs. Now we're going to the, the warnings, the cons of it all. Verse 15 says, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. And then we'll get to the third one, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. So these are the things you need to be looking out for. These are the things, these are the warnings. It's very interesting that looking diligently is actually from our word episkopos, which is a bishop or an overseer. It means we need to oversee each other diligently. As believers, we have a responsibility towards ourselves and towards others. And the first thing that we should be overseeing diligently is lest any man fall short of the grace of God. Now, no one fails in the grace of God in regards to being saved. This is not about, you know, eternal salvation and assurance of faith. The word fail here has the idea of lagging or falling behind or losing heart. Think of it this way. Lot's wife lingered behind, and we know what happened to her. The idea is as we run this race, people are going to get worn out. People are going to get exhausted. And you should be diligently looking around, looking at the people that you see around you. You know them. And if you see anybody getting worn out and they look like they're just lagging behind, you have to episcopos. You have to diligently oversee them and you need to encourage them. You need to remind them that God's grace is still there. God's grace will smack you in the face in the morning when you wake up and will tuck you into bed as you, as you go to sleep. God's grace will never leave us. It will never forsake us. You can't forget about the grace of God. It is always there. And we are to diligently oversee and remind people of this. If you see anyone lagging behind, you need to go after them and not go after them to grind them into the ground and be like, what are you doing? No, understand that he saved us from our sins. He saved us presently. It's a continual salvation. So we need to go to them and say, hey, What's going on? You're looking exhausted. You're looking tired. You know, he saved us from sin, which is singular, the issue of sin. But he also saved us from our sins, plural, the things that we fall into. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful, which is already remarkable, but even more so remarkably, he is just to forgive us to catheterize us, to drain out all that poison that we can get to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we are to oversee one another. You see someone that's starting to lag behind. Go to them. There's accountability in this. Someone claims the name of Christ and they're starting to lag behind. You have a job to go to them and say, what's going on? You're starting to slow down. You're starting to... Stop, you're starting to stop running the race. What's going on here? And challenge them lovingly because we're to pursue peace with all men, but we're still to, to go to them. Secondly, he says, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and therefore many be defiled. A root of bitterness. There's many things that we're told here. Number one, bitterness has a root. Whatever bitterness there may be in our lives, it has a root. It can be from abuse. It can be from neglect. It can be from something that went wrong when we were young. It can be from an injury. But there is a root to a bitterness. And the author is saying we need to encourage one another. You don't need to be Pharisee sticking your nose into everyone else's business and judging one another. But you do need to be encouragers. Paul reminds us that every joint and every ligament supplies. You don't need to kill someone swinging around the beam that's in your eye to go to try to take the, the splinter out of theirs. 
We are to bear one another's burdens. We are to care for one another. And if you see someone struggling with bitterness, you need to go to them and say, how can I pray for you? If you're bitter at somebody, if you have bitterness in your heart towards someone, understand this, that until you forgive them, you're under their power. They have power over your life as long as you are bitter towards them. Yeah, they might have messed with you. They might have hurt you. They might have done something to you. But as long as you remain bitter, they have the power. When you forgive them, you put that power into the Lord's hands. You're now under his power and you're free. You're under his power, not theirs. Now, this is a, I was actually talking with Nicole a lot about this today. And, you know, we always get to this point where we, we hear things like forgive and forget. It doesn't say that you have to forget. I hear people say that all the time. Well, we have to forgive and forget. I don't see that. I'm like, what am I going to do? Put a toothbrush or put something in my ear to try to clean it out of my brain to try to wipe the memory bank, bank clean? There are abuses, there are difficulties, there are hurts that we have had. And when you're 91 years old, when you're 95 years old, they're still there. Not that you forget them, but you're no longer in bondage to them. And that's the big thing. We have to forgive so that we are freed from the bondage of the hurt. God's the one that removes our sin as far as the east is from from the west, right? Right? The forgetting of sin, that's a divine entity. That's a divine aspect. On one hand, I don't want to forget the things that I have forgiven because then I will also forget the grace that was extended. And it makes me forget the grace that I've received. But I don't want to be in bondage to things. So I must forgive because I've been forgiven. And also he who forgives much loves much. And if I want to love others the way that Christ has loved me, that means I have to forgive. But humanistically, I don't think forgetting is part of the equation. I don't. Someone hits you while you're driving and you have a traumatic car accident. 20, 30 years down the road, it's still a memory. Now, the details of the memory might not be as prevalent, but it's still there. It's not like you're going to forget that time that you almost died in a car wreck. But there's forgiveness of what happened. We can't grow being conformed into the image and likeness of Christ if there's bitterness rather than the Holy Spirit being the dominant force in our life. We can't. We can't. We can't grow that way. And beyond that, it says that we defile others. And that word here in in verse 15, defiled, it's passive, which means the other people don't even know it's happening to them. The idea is if you let bitterness be the hallmark of your life and you're always complaining, you're always griping, you always have an axe to grind, it affects other people around you. You never sin to yourself. You don't. There's no sin that only affects you and no one else. Nothing. You can never and you will never sin to yourself. Others will be defiled by that. Others will be defiled by your bitterness. And it says here that it's passive. They don't even know that your bitterness is defiling them. But I've seen it. Someone who's really bitter towards someone, after a while, someone else might start getting bitter as well for no reason. Oh, yeah, we don't like that person. Why? I don't know. I just don't like that person now. But what's the reason? I don't know. It's a passive aspect of defilement. And what's really sad to me about that is other people don't know it's happening to them. My sin, my choosing of sin, is passively defiling those around me. That's scary. That's evil. Because I'm allowing my choices in life to dictate the, and influence someone else's life. And they might not even know it. You know, I think of even my kids. What, are, what things am I influencing my kids with passively? That they're watching, they're observing, they're listening. And what are the passive aspects of impact and influence that I'm having on my children's lives? 
that I might not see, they might not see for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And all of a sudden it's like, whoa, where did that come from? I don't know. It's just, that's what dad always did. That's how, that's what dad always said. That's how dad always reacted. I think when, when I have grandkids, how are my kids going to parent my grandkids? I'm not normal. I think about that stuff. Joshua's young. Abigail's turning 10 in a week. And it's like, what is she going to be like as a mom? What is she going to be like as a parent? What am I doing now that's going to passively influence her parenting? What example am I laying? Because it will come out. It will be seen. And we need to understand that we need to be so careful and so cognizant of letting of not allowing things like bitterness to take root because it will affect those around us. And you can apply that to other things, not just bitterness. Here it's specifically mentioned. But what are the passive aspects of the sin in our life that we aren't understanding is influencing others? That should be an encouragement and a challenge to continually go before the Lord and say, again, I want to sin less, but I want to repent more. And here we have the last two verses, starting in verse 16. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. So lastly, he speaks here of appetites. There are those who fail in the grace of God. Their faith is weak. There are those who struggle with bitterness. And others are going to struggle with fleshly appetites. Now, the, the, these last two verses, I'll be honest, they're, they're hard to kind of exegete. They're hard to kind of chew through. Some scholars feel like the fornicator and the profane person are both speaking of just Esau. Some feel like the, the, the fornicator and the profane person are separate entities or separate people. That the profane is attached to Esau and the fornicator is attached to the culture. Well, for you and I, I think in the practical sense, it, it makes sense that we don't have to dig into this too much. That a fornicator is a profane person and a profane person is a fornicator. That we can just look at it as one and the same. And the idea here is it's warning us about something. Understand that in the Greek culture, in the Roman culture, sexuality was something that was accepted throughout the culture. It's kind of when you look through history again. It was said that a Roman man should have a wife to bear his children, a concubine for pleasure, and a mistress for adventure. That's part of, that's in their history books. That's part of their cultural, in a sense, standards and norms. That was the hallmark. If you could have all three, you've, you've kind of attained. Now, sexual desire is God-given. It's God-designed to be indulged in and enjoyed and used for procreation within the relationship that God prescribes for it to be enjoyed in, and it is not to be misused and used in a thousand different ways. The church in Jerusalem, as it was being formed in Acts 15, when they met, they were trying to figure out, what are we going to do with these Gentiles? The Gentile world, they were coming in, they were getting saved, and they're all saying, what are we going to do with them? They live very differently. And finally, they wrote a letter. And it seemed good to the Holy Spirit to give to us in Acts 15. And basically what they say is, we're going to lay no other necessary burdens on you except these things. Abstain from blood. Abstain from idols. Abstain from things that were strangled, things that were killed. And abstain from fornication. But all of them went together into idolatry. But those are the only things that they said, listen, we know that the Gentile world, the Gentile world lives incredibly different than we do. Here's all we're going to ask. Abstain from fornication. That was one of their main tenets for the Gentile world coming in. Now, when we think specifically about Esau, there was a lot of dark demonic stuff in his life. He was a profane man. One of his wives was actually one of the Nephilim, a demonic wife. And the word profane or profanum, profanus in Latin, it means outside the temple. It means that someone who is outside the threshold of the temple. Now somebody who's holy, and here it's encouraging us, 
in our pursuit of of sanctification to be holy. Someone who's holy is inside the temple. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And do we live in that context? When we think of our fleshly appetites and our desires, are we living within the temple? Or are we living profanely outside the threshold of the temple? Somebody who's profane steps outside of that context into the context or into the thoroughfares of the present world where everything is profane, it's common, it's godless. And the scripture is telling us behind the scenes that Esau was a pretty profane guy. Now he was a, he was a hunter, he was a, a man of the field. I'm sure if you, if you liked camping in the outdoors, he would be a great buddy. That's what he did. That's who he was, but he was a profane man. He lived outside the realm of God. He lived outside the threshold of the temple. And he proved that by selling his birthright, which wasn't really his birthright, for a pot of beans. Esau was a profane man. He was satisfying the appetites of the flesh. And it's something that we're warned against here. If you see someone living in sexual sin, satisfying the appetites of the flesh, again, every joint and every ligament supplies. Now, it doesn't mean that we're to go around again and examining everyone's lives and making sure that no one's profane. We can't use the gossip prayer circles. Well, God, you know, you know, Jim Bob over there is having an affair and we got to pray for him and all this. We can't use prayers of gossip. But we do have to go to the Lord and say, God, I, I, I see a brother, I see a sister that is struggling with this. What do you want to be done? And you have to go work that out with God first. And as he leads and says, all right, you need to go talk to him. Grace received is grace bestowed. There are hard things in life. There are disappointments. There are tears. There are ups and there are downs in our sanctification. But all the way through this, my father is there. He is my running mate. He is your running mate. I'm not enduring as much as Jesus did. I'm not. I haven't shed blood yet in my pursuit of this. When I have a bad day, When I want to throw in the towel, when I say I, because I know you guys have never wanted to throw in the towel in faith, ever. When I mess up, I go to my father because he chastens me, because he loves me. And he does it strictly for my profit. He is the only father who really means it when he says that this hurts me more than it hurts you. I've said that to my kids, and let's be honest, it doesn't. You know, you give them a little spank, it's like, oh, it hurts me more. And your kid's like, yeah, right. He's the only father that can actually say that with honesty. But he chastens us so that we might be partakers with his holiness. That it might yield that peaceable fruit of righteousness in our lives. If you're worn out this evening, if you feel like you're ready to throw in the towel, wherever you are in this journey, I don't care if you're a day into this journey, a week into it, A year, 10 years, 30 years, I don't care where you are at in this journey. If you're feeling weary, we are challenged, we are encouraged to lift up our hands, to get them moving, to loosen those knees. You got another lap in you, you can do it. You're near the finish line, don't give up now. We want it to be as smooth as we can because even in the most difficult place, there can be healing in your life. In our humanistic mind, that's an oxymoron. Difficulty does not equal healing. And what we're being told here is when things are hard, it could be for your benefit. When things are difficult, when you feel as though your world has been shattered and nothing is going good and everything's falling apart, we're being told here, you can be healed. It could be a place of healing. You need to be constantly pursuing peace with other people. Holiness, sanctification. You have to be constantly pursuing a new way of living, a new way of life. And your lives more and more are given over to Christ in that. The less I sin, but the more I repent. We're to go encourage one another. And we are to encourage one another lest people fail of God's objective grace. I don't want to fail in his grace. I don't want to lag behind. I don't want to get lazy in his grace. I want your help. You see me lagging behind? 
kick me in the backside and say, let's go. Time to move. We are to look out in this running. And maybe you've been worn down a bit. And you look out that there's no root of bitterness because when it springs up, it's going to trouble you. And you got to be careful of that. You got to be paying attention to the Lord. I'm a man of unclean lips. In Isaiah, as it says, I'm from a people of unclean lips. Take the coal, touch my lips, purify me, cleanse me, renew, as the word says, a right, a right spirit in me. We're to constantly be going through a, a, a place of self examination. Lord, what's going on in me that's going to come out not only in my life, but it's going to affect those around me? You can never sin to yourself. We are all connected, all of us. Your sin affects me. My sin affects you. And then lastly, we're told to look out as we're finishing this race for body, for fleshly appetites. Fornication, porneo, which is pornography, sexual sin, all these things. We have to look out because there's a part of us that was designed by God to be fulfilled, but we've all fallen sexually. We have, flat out. We don't live in a, a culture, in a world, in a society where sexuality is something that is looked at in a healthy way anymore. There's a purpose to it. And in God's genius and in his, is his design, it's divine. It's divine in its desire when it's of God's design. And God asks us that we should reel that in, that we should bring that under the truth of the word. Profane people are so hungry for the things of the world that they step outside the temple. They step out of the sanctuary. They step out of the place of God, out of the realm of God, into the place of, of self and flesh. And like it even reminds us of, of Esau, though he sought it diligently with tears. There was no place of repentance for him. That's a place that I don't want to see anyone at where there's no longer a place of repentance, where their hearts are so cold. I think of Pharaoh, where he, he hardened his heart against God for so long that after a while God gave him in to his own pleasures and God hardened his heart. That's a scary place for any of us to be or any of us to even be considered looking at or going into. So I'll be telling you right now, if I start seeing you lagging behind, getting tired, bitterness, fornication, you better believe I love you enough to say something and I hope you love me enough to say something. So let's run this race. There is a finish line. We are told that there's a double portion of blessing for us. We have not sold our inheritance. Jesus Christ is still at the center of our lives. And he promises what we run on is not information. It's not facts, but it's his promises because his promises never fail. And the finish line is not that far ahead of us, right? It's not that far. It's coming quick. And you should be encouraging each other as we're on this journey, as we're on this pilgrimage. There are pros and there are cons. There are ups and downs to the sanctification. And we need to be aware of them. We need to be okay with them. If there were no difficulties, if there were no cons, if there were no downs in our sanctification, we would, not, we would stop pursuing Christ because it was all easy. Well, this is Christian life. This is cake. I can get through this. It's nothing but goodness and blessings and reward. Awesome. Those moments of difficulty, though, draw us closer to him and push us closer to him. We don't like difficulty naturally. That's why there's a supernatural element to us. And we are to look at that more of saying, all right, God, this is uncomfortable. This is hard. What are you doing? What's going on? And we should be encouraging one another as we see that happen in each other's lives. We need to be aware of the ups and downs. Next time when we get together, we're going to be looking at the holy city of, of Zion. Comparing Mount Sinai to Mount Zion. Law versus grace. And when we look at Mount Zion, when we look at the place and the origin of grace, it, it puts the finish line in front of us in a remarkable way. And we're going to be considering that next time. Because I don't want to live a life of law. I don't want to live a life of, of structured rules and regulations. Again, Paul was the greatest rule keeper ever. 613 laws that he kept. He was a Jew of Jews. He kept them all. 
He had no better, there was no better pedigree or lineage than his. And his response was, oh, wretched man that I am, I'm the chief of sinners. Because we could try to live our lives by regimented rules and regulations. And as soon as we live lives of law, not of grace, we live a life of flesh and not of spirit. There are ups and downs in this life. There are ups and downs in our sanctification. But it is to work us out and to form us and to shape us into his image, into his likeness. So that as you are being worked out, as you are being put into the gym, people can say, you look different today. You look more like Jesus. And that's the goal, right? That should be our desire. Yeah, it might be uncomfortable going a few rounds with the Holy Spirit. But stepping out of that ring, looking more like Christ is worth it. Amen? Let's pray. Oh, the worship team come back up. Father God, we are thankful for that you just don't leave us alone ever. I'm so thankful for that. Lord, even in the times where we might convince ourselves that you're silent, Lord, you are our ever-present help in time of need. You are never not with us. You are never not for us. And Lord, I think of Paul and Silas that even in the most difficult times of their life as they were prisoned in, in, in chains, what did they do? They worshiped. So Lord, tonight, if there are any of us here that are struggling with bitterness, that are failing and in, in living in, the, in your grace, that we're getting weak, we're lagging, we're starting to fall behind, if we're giving over to fleshly appetites, Lord, tonight, let us worship. If we're going through those difficulties, Lord, if we're going through those downs of our sanctification, let us worship. And Lord, if there are those here that by your grace, Lord, that they're on the, the upswing, that they're experiencing the encouragements, Lord, help them to see whose hands need to be lifted up tonight. Help them to see whose needs, needs need to be put back in joint, whose ways or whose paths need to be made smoother. And let them encourage. And Lord, let us all collectively together worship you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand.
God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against him? If our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against him? God bless you. We thank you so much for coming out midweek and joining us for our Bible study. Keep our pastor in your prayers, Pastor Jim. Thank you for some focus and fellowship. God bless you.